tonight on CBC Vancouver News. Uh, they all began complaining of symptoms this morning. Poisoned, growing concern after another incident involving carbon monoxide also. Well, obviously it's um, great distress. On the move, why are these brand new homes in East Vancouver under threat? And this program is designed to be uh, subtle. No gangsters on the menu. Surrey's latest plan to tackle the ongoing gang problem. This is CBC Vancouver News. Good evening. When the carbon monoxide detector in their home went off this morning, they thought it was malfunctioning. Tonight, the family of five from the BC interior is being treated at Vancouver General Hospital, the latest victims of carbon monoxide poisoning. As the CBC's Tina Lovegreen reports, this incident and another yesterday have first responders pleading with people to protect themselves from this potentially deadly gas. A frantic scene this morning at a family home in Barrier. Our firefighters went in and checked the levels of the carbon monoxide. And at that time, we did realize how high the levels were. First responders were quick to treat the latest victims, a family of five, the youngest, a seven-month-old child. They were airlifted to Vancouver General Hospital, where they were being treated in this hyperbaric chamber. Uh, they all began complaining of symptoms this morning, uh, of the usual carbon monoxide symptoms, headache, nausea, vomiting, dizziness. Uh, one or two of them blacked out. The patients will spend a total of nearly eight hours inside the chamber. They're breathing 300% oxygen. The idea of that is to wash the carbon monoxide out of their blood cells, but also we think that it prevents brain damage down the road. A leaky wood-burning stove may be to blame in this case. And even though the family's carbon monoxide detector went off, they thought it was malfunctioning. The barrier incident is the second case of carbon monoxide poisoning in less than 48 hours. Yesterday, 13 people were rushed to hospital because of a faulty boiler leak at a Vancouver office. And as one patient had collapsed, um, when the paramedics arrived on scene, they actually went into the building and their uh, carbon monoxide alarms had actually gone off. Of the 13 patients from yesterday, one remains in hospital. Paramedics um, receive yeah. about 100 carbon monoxide calls a year. They usually ramp up during the winter months, but these recent incidents have first responders begging people to install carbon monoxide detectors. These are the only way to detect it, and if you or your family uh, have an alarm and it starts to go off, it's time to get outside, get fresh air, and call 911 from outside. A message shared by doctors at VGH. We do everything we can do, and we can only do so much. So the, the key is prevention. So the message is, for less than $100, you could save your family's life. Tina Lovegreen, CBC News, Vancouver. East Vancouver residents are sounding the alarm about a proposed development slated for Renfrew Street. It would replace a row of homes with 73 rental housing units. As Jason Proctor from our investigative unit reports, neighbors say they've got no problem with new homes, but how new is new enough? The foundations on these two houses are barely settled, but already their future is under threat as the city of Vancouver considers the removal of two of its newest homes to make way for an even bigger four-story, 73-unit multifamily dwelling. Uh, well, obviously, it's um, great distress. Neighbours say they can't understand why the city would consider getting rid of houses and laneway homes that were only just approved. Our belief is that once the city approved of these buildings, um, followed through and they were brought to completion, there's no way they should be removed or demolished. The developer says he plans to move the buildings, not tear them down. Regardless, neighbours fear the worst. Well, it's on a, it's on a hill, right? So what it's going to do, it's going it, to... You, you'll see the monstrosity, right? Uh, they, they, they proposed a six-storey building. Now, I... I think they went down to four stories, right? That, and I think it's, I think it's just the wrong location for, uh, for that type of structure. The proposal comes as a result of a land assembly, a process that's become a bonanza for people living on arterial routes as council looks for more density and both developers and homeowners on busy streets see dollar signs. The neighbours we spoke to don't want to come across as NIMBYs. They say they're open to affordability and density, but 
th this neighborhood has already changed quite a lot. This is the Adnac bike path that brings a ton of bike traffic and it's kind of interrupted the traffic flow around here, not to mention the flow of traffic and parking uh, in the alleys behind here as well. And we are right beside the PNE. They're also concerned about the traffic that 73 additional residential units would bring, not to mention the fact we're on a hill. So that means they say that their sun would be blocked in the afternoons, and that's a particular concern on a nice day. The developer says he bought the two new houses from another developer who built them where one old house used to stand. Alex Ploquin is one of four people who share the $3,100 a month rent for the main floors of one house. Well, I mean, on the one hand, it certainly benefited us. Uh, it's not like finding things around here is easy. Um, but on the other hand, yeah, that just seems like, a, like from an environmental standpoint, that seems like a massive waste of resources. The neighbors say they've already lived through the three years of construction it took to build the two new houses. The neighborhood breathed and thought, well, now that they're doing this, surely they can't turn around and build one of these developments. But lo and behold, they're trying to do it. Now it's up to the city to see if even more construction is on the horizon. Jason Proctor, CBC News, Vancouver. And there is a public meeting scheduled for Monday between 5 and 7 at the Hastings Community Centre. And if you know of a story our investigative unit should be looking into, you can contact us at investigate at cbc.ca. Police in Surrey will now be able to remove known gang members from bars and restaurants. The hope is it'll deter violent offenders from hanging out in the city altogether. As John Hernandez reports, the program starts with seven locations but is expected to expand. This program is designed to be uh, subtle. Officer in charge Dwayne McDonald unveils Surrey's latest tool to improve public safety. It's called the Inadmissible Patrons Program and it allows police to quietly remove known gang members from bars and restaurants. It's not designed uh, for people to come in and drag people out of restaurants or cause any sort of uh, commotion or scene or embarrassment. Several pubs are part of the IPP, which is modeled after Vancouver's Restaurant Watch program. The goal is to protect innocent bystanders from gang shootings that often occur in busy public places. The program was a key recommendation from the previous mayor's task force on gang violence. But times have changed. We're on a timeline to have our own police force within two years. Surrey is facing mounting debt and pressure to move ahead on plans for a municipal police force. Despite Mayor Doug McCallum's claims that it will keep the community safe during the transition, the latest city budget won't allow the RCMP to hire any new officers. I don't know that you'll find a police chief in the city that uh, will ever celebrate uh, a lack of resources or cut to their resources. The city has also postponed construction of several libraries, community centres and other social projects to save over $100 million in spending. For community advocate Cal DeSange, the recent moves run counter to the campaign promises that got the Safe Surrey Coalition into City Hall. They're taking away essential programs that are necessary to keep these kids away from that drug and gang lifestyle. The need is not later on down the road. The need is now. We don't need to lose another child to a senseless, violent death when we could be providing these children with the programs that are absolutely necessary at this moment, at this juncture. A juncture defined by an ongoing Lower Mainland gang war that some members of this community can only withstand for so long. John Hernandez, CBC News, Surrey. Dozens of workers in Burnaby spent hours in the cold after a gas line rupture late last night. It happened in the parking lot of a linen cleaning facility here on Enterprise Road. One worker told CBC News they heard a loud explosion just before midnight and then they were told to leave the building. The gas was turned off and Fortis spent the day today fixing the line. This comes at a time when Fortis has already asked people to cut down on natural gas usage after a rupture of one of its pipelines near Prince George in October. Some tense moments in Victoria today as Speaker Daryl Pleck has faced new questions about the recent suspensions of two high-profile personnel. Speaking at a meeting of the Legislative Assembly Management Committee, Liberal MLA Mary Polak asked for more details about the suspensions of the legislature's clerk and sergeant-at-arms. Gary Lenz and Craig James were escorted out of the legislature last month amidst an ongoing RCMP investigation. The pair have since said they don't know anything about the allegations against them. 
Today, Plekis maintained he was simply doing his job. There's a potential for people's reputations to be tarnished. Of course, I'm going to approach this with the greatest amount of caution, advice, and due diligence. That is exactly what I did. Every single turn, we were shut down in terms of asking our questions, couldn't ask those questions, they couldn't be answered. Two special advisors have been brought in to work with the speaker and two special prosecutors have also been assigned to the case. Okay, I know I complain about the cold all the time. <laughs> really? No. But <laughs> I'm actually really excited because I hear we could be getting some of the white stuff tomorrow. Just a hint of it, yes. I know you are a snow lover. We don't have a ton of it in the forecast, but there is a special weather statement from Environment Canada in place for Metro Vancouver for this transition time when we see a marine system move in Friday overnight into Saturday. So I'm going to break it down for you because that risk for wet snow also includes the risk for some freezing rain in the Fraser Valley. We do have one more cold and clear night ahead of us. It's a chilly one out here once again. Look for another frosty start. Uh, let me take you through the temperatures across the south coast. A little cooler than where we were at this time yesterday. Freezing mark right now at YVR, West Van, Pitt Meadows, Abbotsford, uh, minus one over at uh, Victoria Airport. So uh, feeling those temperatures dip a little sooner than the past couple of nights. This is all thanks to that clear high pressure system in place. I actually didn't put them on because I kind of like how you can see it so clearly in the satellite. Uh, BC out towards Alberta and Saskatchewan, clear skies as we look at the satellite tonight. And then we've got that system moving in from the west and you can see those thicker clouds associated with that low pressure system that will be our new story as we head into the weekend. So tomorrow, really a transition day, down to a minus four tonight. We've still got lots of sun to start your Friday. Increasing clouds is really the big change for tomorrow, and I will time out the arrival of the snow and the risk for freezing rain as we head into Saturday morning coming up. All right, thanks very much, Johanna. You're welcome. And just a reminder, you can also watch on our website as well as Facebook and YouTube. Our show is commercial free. If you need a reason to watch online, you can also watch the show on demand or catch up on any of the stories you might have missed out on. Well, we're continuing our series tonight on cities across BC with new mayors and new challenges. On the west coast of Vancouver Island, fishing, of course, has always been a way of life. But as the federal government considers new steps to help protect the orca population, local economies could be challenged. Justin McElroy reports from Euclid. We're on the west coast of Vancouver Island right now, where the environment and the economy have always gone hand in hand. Well, we're heading to Euclid, where because of a recent federal regulation, the conversation is a little bit different. With the southern resident orca population declining, the federal government is moving forward on creating new critical habitat areas off the coast, which would allow them to put restrictions on fishing. A tough file for any new mayor to deal with. What do you do when something like this is dropped on your doorstep uh, the first week of becoming mayor? I really knew that Euclid alone couldn't do something about it. It definitely had to be a regional voice, and that was with, uh, with the, the neighboring communities of Tofino, Portal Burnie, and the First Nation communities all had to stay united on this. A coalition is building, and it includes Indigenous communities. It's very frustrating, especially for a nation where you have multiple generations that are going to be affected. We think about things in seven generations. Larry Johnson runs a seafood enterprise owned by six regional First Nations. We spent decades trying to negotiate a modern-day treaty that will include land and sea resources that we've been connected to since time immemorial. Um, yeah, is it frustrating? Absolutely it's frustrating, especially when it's spelled out that we must be consulted in a meaningful way. And that hasn't happened. What's going to happen if the federal government comes back and says, no, we're cancelling these fisheries indefinitely? It puts a level of distrust in the federal government in general with what kind of actions they've done up to this point to get to that, to make that decision. And uh, it's disastrous for a community. In recent decades, more and more tourists have come to Euclid, and for good reason. But fishing continues to be a critical industry for virtually everyone in town. Lynette O'Brien organized a petition to send to the government. She's a captain on a sport fishing boat, a guide on a whale watching boat, 
and hopes a middle ground can be reached. Oh, it's really important. Um, I know the sports fishing alone brings about $7 million into our economy annually, and that's all the different businesses in the town kind of get a piece of that pie. I guess because if you talk to people in town, they uh, understand that the orca population needs to be protected too. Right? Absolutely, we love the whales. Uh, we, fishing's really important, the whales are really important, it's all important to our economy, and I don't think anyone cares as much as we do. This is our backyard. Like, you've got to be on pins and needles just waiting for the government to make their decisions. Yes, definitely. I know people aren't taking bookings and that sort of thing. I think it'll be a big relief to hear one way or the other. The federal government will be making their decision on the two fisheries soon. In the meantime, all people here can do is worry and wonder and wait. Justin McElroy, CBC News, Euclid. The Canadian arrest of a high-profile tech executive is causing diplomatic tensions to soar worldwide. The Huawei CFO was arrested at YVR on Saturday at the United States' request. We'll have the latest after the break. Well, thanks so much for tuning in online tonight. As you may have heard, it's open house and Food Bank Day here at CBC tomorrow. Hopefully you can visit our studios here in Vancouver or make a donation. Maybe both. Mm -hmm. While BC's food banks are always happy to receive donations of food, it's not really what they cherish. We'll explain tonight in Food Bank Facts, starting with this one, and uh, Mike is hosting it. There are 100 food banks in British Columbia. One of the biggest, the Greater Vancouver Food Bank. And this is the busiest time of the year. So I know there's, there's always a need, but we're in the holiday season, so how are things right now? They are getting busy. So we take in about 70% of our overall revenue in the last three months of the calendar year. So monetary donations and uh, food drive donations, drop-offs and pickups. So everything gets very busy, every department of the food bank. 22% of the people the food bank supports are children and youth in Vancouver, Burnaby, New Westminster, and the North Shore. We support 27 to 28,000 people a week, all in, through all of our locations and agency partners. Those partners include shelters, soup kitchens, and school lunch programs. So we support almost 90 agencies in Greater Vancouver, and they run meal programs, youth programs, snack programs, shelters, drop-ins, neighborhood houses. Provincially, one out of every three food bank users is a child. 10,000 seniors access a food bank every month. The smallest food bank in BC is in Sorrento, with 24 clients every month. In Vancouver, over the past three to four months, they've seen a 30% increase in demand from six to 8,000 people a week, and they're not entirely sure why. I think it's a combination, probably, of I think demand is, is going up. I mean, two-thirds of the people who are food insecure, so who aren't confident or know they won't have enough money to make it to the end of the month, um, two-thirds of those people are working. So uh, people are just trying really hard to make ends meet. And while food donations are always welcome, the food banks don't hesitate to say what's really needed. We really need the money, the monetary donations, uh, for a couple of reasons. One, we can stretch it. So with our buying power, uh, whether it's dealing directly with farmers or working with our grocery retailers to get wholesale prices, we can essentially triple the value of a dollar, and that's huge in terms of impact for our members. And with the money that's donated? We buy about 5,400 liters of milk and 10,000 eggs and distribute them to our various locations. 10,000 eggs, that goes... 10,000 eggs, that's 3,300 three-egg omelets. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that, that's definitely a lot. Um, the reason for the cash donations was explained there, but... Mm -hmm. Uh, and, and, and of course, they don't mind if people want to drop stuff off, whether it's there or at many of the places you can drop stuff off. But it, that requires a lot of labor to process it, you know, make sure the cans and, and goods are in, in good shape and, and expiry dates haven't gone by. So uh, that's the reason for encouraging the uh, uh, cash donations, well, which we hope we'll see tomorrow. And just like we saw in Surrey, mm -hmm. with the money, they can buy what they need for certain clients. Right, yeah. exactly. Mm -hmm. Yes, and this leads us to reminding people that yes. tomorrow 
is a big day for CBC's 32nd annual Food Bank Day. Doors open at uh, 6 a.m. and we'll present live radio throughout the day right until 6 p.m. You can also come right up here on set. Uh, you can learn some of the ropes, meet some people you hear and watch every day. Us, Dan Burrett, Leanne Young. Um, of course, this day is all about giving, though, so we will be taking donations for food banks province-wide all day long. We hope to see you then. And you can actually try the teleprompter. Johanna will have the green screen out. Lots of fun things. I'll clean up the desk here, too. Open House and Food Bank Day is coming up. It is a day when we raise money for local food banks right across British Columbia. We spring open the doors of 700 Hamilton Street. We invite the public in. It's a day of generosity and a day of giving. The arrest of a prominent Chinese telecom executive in Vancouver is adding tension to the relationship between Ottawa and Beijing. U.S. authorities are accusing Meng Wanzhou uh, and tech giant Huawei of violating sanctions against Iran. Canada detained her after a U.S. extradition request. And as David Cochran explains tonight, Beijing isn't likely to forget Canada's role anytime soon. The appropriate authorities uh, took the decisions in this case uh, without any political involvement or interference. The Prime Minister insists politics played no role in the arrest of Meng Wanzhou, but it's certain to be political now. Canada is now in the middle of two economic giants and their proxy war. Those giants, the U.S. and China, are locked in an escalating trade and tariff war, where each provocation jolts the global economy. Markets plunged today after news of this arrest, which comes after years of U.S. hostility to Huawei. The American government labels Huawei a national security threat, one that could use its technology to spy for the Chinese government. The U.S. and several other countries have banned it from their 5G networks. Canada has not though this analyst warns this arrest could make Canada a target anyway. The biggest risk to Canada right now is some form of retaliation either against Canadian businesses or Canadians in China. It's happened before. In 2014, after Canada arrested and extradited a Chinese hacker to the U.S., Kevin and Julia Garrett were arrested by China on accusations of espionage. Kevin Garrett spent two years in Chinese detention before he was released. Every day we get more reasons to ban Huawei from our 5G network. That history has the Conservatives pushing the government to say no way to Huawei, which the Liberals still aren't ready to do. We will rely on our experts, our national security experts, in making a final decision. There are the national security interests, but also the economic ones. China is the world's second largest market. Trudeau is eager to boost trade ties, also eager not to be tied too closely to this arrest. There was no uh, engagement or involvement uh, in the political level uh, in this decision because we respect the independence of our judicial processes. That is how it works in Canada. The question is, will China buy it? David Cochran, CBC News, Ottawa. Meanwhile, trade talks continue between China and the United States, and for the time being, the Chinese government seems unwilling to let the arrest derail the conversation. CBC's Asia correspondent Sasha Petrasik has more from Beijing. We're starting to hear some response, some of the other voices about this arrest here in China, and they're coming from the state media, in this case from the Global Times. It's a tabloid that sometimes reflects government uh, thinking, and sometimes it overstates it. In any case, it does have a certain nationalistic bent whenever China feels that it's been insulted. Uh, in this case, it is accusing the United States of a despicable rogues approach, that it is trying to uh, attack Huawei, it is trying to sideline this huge telecom company, this Chinese company, uh, because it wants to get rid of it, to get rid of the competition to American firms and others in the West. It is saying that the Chinese government should stand up to the United States over this, but it should also continue talking about other issues and continue to defend China's interests. That's the interesting part, because it does look as though China intends to continue with the negotiations with the United States, the kind of talks that they started in Buenos Aires. Uh, and uh, just today, for instance, the Ministry of Commerce announced that it is going to be implementing right away 
some of the measures that they discussed in the fields of agriculture and energy and cars, uh, and that it is very confident that it will be able to come up with an agreement with the United States over the other outstanding trade issues. Uh, it's predicting very smooth talks. Now, the interesting part is that this is all happening in the shadow of this arrest. In other words, the Chinese government knows what has happened, but it looks as though it is determined to go ahead and not let that derail this other uh, relationship that it has with the Americans because it really does want a trade deal. Sasha Petrosek, CBC News, Beijing. Seems BC made the grade this year on a key women's rights issue. West Coast Leaf has given the province an A minus in its latest report card following the NDP's billion dollar commitment to child care. The annual report card tracks BC's progress in meeting international obligations to promoting women's equality. At the same time, there is room for improvement, according to the report, particularly when it comes to matters of prison and violence, two issues that disproportionately affect women of color and particularly indigenous women and girls. No, there are some areas of improvement and the majority of areas in this year's uh, report card did improve. That said, we are so far from having a society where uh, women's human rights are fully respected and their needs are met. Um, so it's no time to be complacent. In fact, now is an ideal time to continue holding government accountable to make sure that uh, we're not falling behind on international human rights standards. Leaf is also concerned about the loosening of rules around the rights of transgendered women in prison, especially when it comes to strip searches. And with less than 24 hours until the referendum on BC's voting system comes to a close, Elections BC says it has received about 40% of the mail-in ballots. If you haven't voted and still want to, you can still do it, but only in person. There are referendum service offices set up across the province. Visit electionsbc.ca to find the nearest one to you. Well, they always, of course, welcome donations of food, but as we head into tomorrow's Food Bank Day here at CBC, we'll tell you what they really hope you'll give. That's coming up.
Thanks for joining us. Here are some of the stories we're following tonight on CBC Vancouver News at 6. Headache, nausea, vomiting, dizziness. Uh, one or two of them blacked out. Growing concern after two incidents in two days involving carbon monoxide poisoning. The latest in Barrier, where a family of five had to be airlifted to Vancouver General Hospital for treatment. An environmental standpoint, that seems like a massive waste of resources. Residents in East Vancouver are concerned about a proposed development along Renfrew Street. It would replace a row of homes with 73 units of rental housing. The problem is it also means potentially destroying some brand new homes, something some are calling wasteful. It's not designed uh, for people to come in and drag people out of restaurants or cause any sort of uh, commotion or scene or embarrassment. Off the menu, Mounties in Surrey can now remove known gangsters from bars and restaurants around the city. The Inadmissible Patrons Program aims to deter violent offenders from hanging out in Surrey at all. It'll be rolled out gradually, starting with seven locations. Well, as you've likely heard, it's CBC Open House and Food Bank Day tomorrow. Hopefully you can visit our studios here in Vancouver or make a donation, maybe both. While VC's food banks are always happy to receive donations of food, it's not really what they cherish. Mike explains in Food Bank Facts, starting with this one. There are 100 food banks in British Columbia. One of the biggest, the Greater Vancouver Food Bank. And this is the busiest time of the year. So I know there's, there's always a need, but we're in the holiday season, so how are things right now? They are getting busy, so we take in about 70% of our overall revenue in the last three months of the calendar year. So monetary donations and uh, food drive donations, drop-offs and pickups. So everything gets very busy, every department of the food bank. 22% of the people the food bank supports are children and youth in Vancouver, Burnaby, New Westminster and the North Shore. We support 27 to 28,000 people a week, all in, through all of our locations and agency partners. Those partners include shelters, soup kitchens, and school lunch programs. So we support almost 90 agencies in Greater Vancouver, and they run meal programs, youth programs, snack programs, shelters, drop-ins, neighborhood houses. Provincially, one out of every three food bank users is a child. 10,000 seniors access a food bank every month. The smallest food bank in BC is in Sorrento, with 24 clients every month. In Vancouver, over the past three to four months, they've seen a 30% increase in demand from six to 8,000 people a week, and they're not entirely sure why. I think it's a combination, probably, of I think demand is, is going up. I mean, two-thirds of the people who are food insecure, so who aren't confident or know they won't have enough money to make it to the end of the month, um, two-thirds of those people are working. So uh, people are just trying really hard to make ends meet. And while food donations are always welcome, the food banks don't hesitate to say what's really needed. We really need the money, the monetary donations, uh, for a couple of reasons. One, we can stretch it. So with our buying power, uh, whether it's dealing directly with farmers or working with our grocery retailers to get wholesale prices, we can essentially triple the value of a dollar, and that's huge in terms of impact for our members. And with the money that's donated? We buy about 5,400 liters of milk and 10,000 eggs and distribute them to our various locations. 10,000 eggs, that goes... 10,000 eggs, that's 3,300 three-egg omelets. <laughs> So, kind of like the three egg omelet. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, tomorrow is the day. Yes. It's CBC's annual, uh, 32nd annual actually, Food Bank Day. And we do have a lot of stuff planned. Yeah, we do. The doors open at 6 a.m. Uh, we've got live radio throughout the day right until uh, 6 o'clock. You can come down and watch those live shows. And while you're here, you can also take a tour of the CBC newsroom. You can come right up here, uh, learn some of the ropes, learn how to work the teleprompter. Johanna brings out the green screen, so just make sure if you do come that you're not wearing green or it'll get it'll lost. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and you can meet, you know, some of the people that you hear and watch every day. Us, uh, Dan Burrett, Leanne Young. Of course, the day is all about giving, though, so yeah. we will be taking donations uh, for food banks province-wide all day long. We hope to see you. We certainly do. Right now, you're looking at a live shot of BC Place in Vancouver. Minus five today in some parts of Metro Vancouver. 
But change is coming, and that brings maybe a chance of snow. Will the white stuff hit the ground here? Johanna has the prediction next. Johanna's here, mm -hmm. talking about uh, slushy, mushy, maybe. Th those are highly technical. Those things. are all the adjectives <laughs> I was going to is use. Right? Slushy, yeah. mushy, yes, a bit of this, a bit of that. That, <laughs> That is all of that is what we're watching for about this time, well, a little later than this time tomorrow night. So great day to come down uh, to CBC for our open house. Yeah. It's tomorrow overnight that we'll watch for uh, some of the uh, this and that. Let me take you through the time lapse today. It was a stunning start. I like how you can see the steam there. Uh, very chilly with, uh, as you mentioned before, commercial minus five temperatures at YVR. Lots of frost on the ground. Uh, definitely a bundle up kind of day. We did warm up to a couple degrees above the freezing mark, but that is what your Friday morning should look like. We've got another chilly night ahead of us. Zero right now at YVR, minus five up towards Kelowna. Still dealing with a modified Arctic air, ma air mass across a huge swath of the country. Minus 21 up towards Geraldton right now. And starting to lose those seasonal temperatures uh, across the lower Great Lakes. Minus two and through Toronto, minus one for Ottawa. Taking you through the next 24 hours, there's that minus four tonight. We still have those clear skies, so any heat we have gained today, and it's not much radiating away quickly through the overnight. So a beautiful start, lots of blue sky. I think we'll make it past the noon hour. So if you are coming down uh, for the early edition, uh, you might want to bundle up if you're headed out. So I think that this is going to be one of our cooler mornings yet. Back up to a four by the afternoon, and this is when we start to see those increasing clouds slide in. Watch as I take you through the overnight forecast model. Not much to speak of in the way of clouds or precip. Stopping you at 7 a.m., lots of blue skies out there. And then we'll watch the high cloud creep across the island. I think we'll see that first band of high cirrus around the uh, mid-afternoon hour. Uh, thickening up as we head into the evening, but the rain and the rain snow mix should hold off until overnight. I don't think we'll get anything until after midnight, uh, Friday into Saturday. So here's that high pressure shifting eastward. That's allowing that milder Pacific air to slide in from the southwest. We'll catch it on the south and central coastal sections first, uh, and that goes for Tofino up towards Port Hardy by tomorrow evening. Watch the blue, though, as that milder Pacific air moves into our modified Arctic air mass Saturday morning. That's our best chance for a shot of snow. We will certainly see it on the local mountains 
at lower elevation, we should have a much better idea of timing uh, this time tomorrow, but I do think we will see some wet snow and the possibility for freezing rain, and that's what the special weather statement uh, issued for Metro Vancouver is really honing in on, that risk for some patchy freezing rain early Saturday morning in the Fraser Valley. And I know a lot of us have uh, travel plans, uh, holiday travel plans quickly adding up. So uh, just pay attention to the roads before you head out Saturday morning. Again, especially if you're in lower lying areas of Metro Vancouver. We'll see those temperatures warm up though, uh, back to a five by the afternoon. So very quickly that wet snow, freezing rain mix will transition to showers. Looks like there's a lot coming down in that icon, but <laughs> all in all, there isn't a lot of precipitation. I'm thinking maybe two to five millimeters at best. If you see any accumulating snow at this point, I'm thinking maybe one to two centimeters before it melts as we get that warm up. As we head into Sunday and Monday, now the door is open to Pacific Systems. We've actually got some bigger rainmakers ahead of us. Sunday does look like a bit of a washout. Another one moves in for Tuesday. We'll find some breaks in there as we head into a milder and wetter week. We just have to get through that uh, mushy, mushy, Mushy. Or the other adjectives you use. Yeah. It just looks very dramatic. It does look dramatic. I know. I've got to put a call into the weather graphics. We need something with just a touch of wet snow. I'll see what I can do. Thanks Add it to the repertoire. Sure. Thanks, Joe. Exactly. You're welcome. A sad day in Canada was remembered today. The Ecole Polytechnique massacre has become a rallying cry for people to stand up against violence against women. We take you to Montreal next. Hi, I'm Amy Bell, and here's what's in your CBC Vancouver inbox. Our annual Open House and Food Bank Day is back this Friday. Join us for live broadcasts, musical performances, and tours of the newsroom, all for a good cause. And CBC Vancouver is a proud sponsor of the Corleone Men's Choir. Don't miss their upcoming production of Christmas with Corleone. Get your tickets for this festive concert today. For more on these events, check us out online. Well, a somber anniversary was marked today in Montreal. Snow fell as 14 beams of lights lit up the night skies to remember a tragic day in Canada's history. 29 years ago today, 14 women students at Montreal's École Polytechnique were separated from their male colleagues 
shot and killed. The massacre shook the country, leading to a tightening of gun control laws. And it wasn't just Montreal remembering. All across the country, ceremonies marked the day, now remembered as the National Day of Remembrance and Action on Violence Against Women. Here in Vancouver, pairs of shoes were laid on the steps of the art gallery to symbolize the more than 1,000 women killed as a result of violence in our province. The annual display also includes the names of those murdered. One of today's speakers says she didn't know her birth mother was dead until she saw her name on the Shoe Memorial website. It's important to speak. It's important to share our stories. Um, so yes, I do believe my standing up and saying out loud that my mother was murdered and uh, the justice system failed us. I, I do think that's important for people to hear that and that violence still takes place daily. Kirkland says that the dialogue around violence towards women has increased, but the justice system is not working. Shoes included in today's display will be donated to emergency shelters for women and children in need. Premier John Horgan is in Montreal tonight for the First Minister's meeting where tensions are running high. Some of the other province's leaders have been publicly critical of the agenda. And Ontario Premier Doug Ford is threatening to walk out. The CBC's Katie Simpson has more from Montreal. Difficult disagreements are pretty obvious as the Prime Minister and Premiers prepare for what is expected to be a very interesting 24 hours. Ontario's Premier Doug Ford is threatening to walk out on tomorrow's gathering if Justin Trudeau doesn't change the agenda and how the meeting is run. Ford is the loudest critic so far and he met with Trudeau this afternoon to privately demand there be dedicated talks on pipelines, the oil crisis and Bill C-69. Before that meeting, Trudeau said he's open to discussing whatever the premiers like and met Ford's threat with some indifference. I'm looking forward to a productive dis discussion. I don't have any illusions that we're all going to agree on everything, but I certainly know that Canadians expect us to be able to roll up our sleeves and talk constructively about how we're going to solve the challenges they're facing. The premiers and their senior staffers are sitting down with the prime minister tonight for a pre-meeting dinner. No doubt, whatever the mood is inside, it will set the tone for tomorrow's meeting if it does go ahead as planned. Given how much political posturing has already taken place, it is likely that it could overshadow any substantive work some had hoped this gathering would achieve. Katie Simpson, CBC News, Montreal. While well, the agenda for the First Minister's meeting sets trade as the focus, there's a good chance carbon taxing could end up being a hot-button topic. Ashi Capellos of CBC's Power and Politics looks at this escalating battle. It will no longer be free to pollute. Here's the option I want to see on the table. Scrap your carbon tax. We say yes to a made in Manitoba green plan without a carbon tax. The Liberal government announced its plan for a national carbon tax in October of 2016. There is no hiding from climate change. But now find themselves in a battle with several provinces. The deal was, and still is, this. Each jurisdiction must impose a carbon price of $25 per ton in 2019 and a plan to raise it by 2022. There was some trepidation, but not two months later, every province and territory signed on to it except Saskatchewan. Now is not the time. 2018 is not the time for attacks. This year, though, the dominoes began to fall behind Saskatchewan when Ontario voters ousted the Liberals and elected a PC government. It is absolutely the worst tax anyone could put on the workers and families of Ontario. I'll tell you, that's done. The carbon tax is over. Suddenly, Ottawa faced a constitutional challenge from two provinces. Then, in October, Manitoba bailed on its carbon price commitment. We have no choice, in my estimation, but to stand up and say no. With opposition mounting, Ottawa dug in its heels. It's unfortunate to see that there are still politicians, conservative politicians specifically across the country, who still think pollution should be free we will be moving forward with putting a price on pollution. Then last month, the PCs toppled the Liberals in New Brunswick and joined the opposition's ranks. We will join other provinces like Saskatchewan and Ontario in asserting the rights of provinces to say no to a carbon tax. That makes four provinces which refuse to comply with Ottawa's price on carbon, nearly half the country's population. And don't forget Alberta, which is now threatening to pull its support too, unless the Trans Mountain Pipeline expansion gets built. 
taking action to fight climate change is fundamentally important, but we've always said that it has to go hand in hand with ensuring economic strength and prosperity. That pipeline is right now under review and it's unclear when or if it will get built. If Alberta did abandon the carbon program, that would tip the scales. The feds would then have to impose a carbon tax on more than half the country's population. That report from CBC's Vashi Capellos, the host of Power and Politics. Price of oil is dropping tonight over fears OPEC won't cut production. The world's biggest oil cartel was expected to slow down its output, but tonight the Saudi energy minister says he's not sure OPEC members will agree to the plan. Are you confident you, you have a, an agreement set for tomorrow? Though. No, I'm not confident. If OPEC does agree to cut production, it would likely start in January for six months. Analysts expect the cut would be about a million barrels of oil per day. And the Prime Minister also took some time to sit down with the co-host of The National, Rosemary Barton. In part of his interview, Trudeau says his government is looking at ways to help workers in Alberta's oil industry. Uh, we, we are absolutely looking at the tools we have around EI. We're looking at the tools we have around uh, income support. Uh, we've done a number of things around that, around situations in the past, and we're going to continue to do that. And I'm also willing, of course, to, to sit down with Premier Notley and uh, hear about how the federal government can be a partner in solving this But she's this told you she wanted you to buy rail cars, for instance. You know, that's, that's something we're, we're happy to look at. If, if that's a proposal that, that she thinks is, is going to make a significant difference, then, then we're happy to to look at how it works. You can see more of Rosemary's chat with Trudeau tonight. The National airs at 10 p.m. just before Sunday, CBC Vancouver News at 11 with Dan Burrett. The federal government has reached a tentative agreement in a class action lawsuit. It's over the abuse suffered by Indigenous children at Indian day schools. Canada will invest $200 million to promote wellness, language and culture for day school survivors. Details regarding individual compensation will be released in the new year. The man who led the case says he and other survivors can now begin to heal. And we know we still have lots of work to do, but I know with your support, you the Canadians of this country, and I know you may not know some of the damages that have happened. And for me, I forgive you for that. Because for me, without forgiveness, Things stay the same. Since the 1920s, nearly 200,000 Indigenous children were forced to attend day schools. Just as in residential schools, many suffered physical, psychological and sexual abuse and were prevented from practicing their culture. In BC, day schools operated in Bella Bella, Hartley, Bay Coxsila, Port Essington and Tacus. Facebook knowingly sold users' data according to a huge cache of secret emails that were made public. As CBC's Dominic Velitis explains, the papers reveal other sensitive issues Facebook has tried to keep private. Well, British MPs investigating Facebook have released more than 200 pages of documents. The majority of them cover the period between 2012 and 2015. So we're talking here about the first three years after Facebook went public. Now, these documents were actually brought to light by a U.S. software company called 643, which gathered them as part of a legal case against the social media giant. And among them are numerous emails from Mark Zuckerberg and other key members of his staff. They show a number of things, including how the tech giant entered into so-called whitelisting agreements with certain companies, giving them more access to users' friends' data despite making changes to end the practice in 2015. They also show how Facebook knew that an update to its Android app that let it collect records of users' calls and texts would be controversial, and that to mitigate any bad PR, the company planned to make it as hard as possible for users to know about the feature. One more interesting revelation here. These documents also show how Facebook used data by one analytics firm to determine which mobile apps were popular with the public, information it used to decide which firms to acquire or treat as a threat. British lawmakers say the documents once again raise questions about how Facebook treats users' data, their policies for working with other app developers, and how they go about exercising their dominant position in the social media market. 
Facebook, meanwhile, says the released internal correspondence is misleading, adding it only represents a small part of the story. Dominic Velaitis, CBC News, London. How much would you pay for the perfect bottle of whiskey? $100, maybe even $500. What if it is considered rare? We'll tell you how much one bottle is going for as it makes its Canadian debut in Vancouver. Open House and Food Bank Day is coming up. It is a day when we raise money for local food banks right across British Columbia. We spring open the doors of 700 Hamilton Street. We invite the public in. It's a day of generosity and a day of giving. Well, do you fancy a wee dram? <laughs> That's pretty good. <laughs> because one of the rarest whiskeys in the world was unveiled today. I'm not going to do this in a Scottish accent. <laughs> the Belvani 50 is expected to retail for between $75,000 and $100,000. There's only 110 bottles of this particular whiskey available around the world. So what makes this bottle so special? Why it's called the marriage is they've, it's not just a single cask. They've taken four American casks where it's been aged for that amount of time and blended them together to craft this unique flavor in that. Two years ago, another bottle of Belvenese exclusive whiskey was brought to Vancouver. That bottle retailed for $45,000. That's, I mean, wow. so much so much more affordable. $45,000. So yeah, should have gone in last year. We get several thousand of our friends to chip in and maybe exactly. we could buy a bottle. Right? Each get half a, yeah, half a shot. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, you were there. Well, Canada's real life version of the Polar Express is set to arrive in Port Coquitlam just under two weeks from now on December 18th. This year, the train started in Montreal and is currently making its way through Saskatchewan. The CP train is rolling through dozens of stops as it heads for our coast. Along for the ride are popular country music stars Kelly Prescott and Terry Clark. Yeah, and at each stop, food and money raised goes to local food banks. The program has raised nearly $15 million over the last 20 years. The holiday train rolls into Golden, B.C., on the 14th, and it'll be here in the Lower Mainland on the 17th and 18th. Wow. That's a really good idea. I feel like any time you see Terry Clark, Kelly Prescott, 
and you a just, train. And a train. You just want to donate money yeah, to the exactly, food bank. Yeah. Or you want to put on your cowboy boots and go dancing. or do One of the two. Too, yeah. yeah, it's sure. a good combo. <laughs> yeah. So we're, uh, we're all here tomorrow, bright and early. As may all of you be as well. Mm -hmm. Please come on down. Visit us. Open House and Food Bank Day. And uh, it'll be a good time. I know. Excited to meet you. You can always find our news program online, cbc.ca slash bc. Dan Burrett is here at 11 o'clock. Have a good See night. See you tomorrow. Good night.